So let's get started. There are a couple announcements. Um, the first one is there is an AI club being formed on campus. What's that? And you can see the the flyer. First meeting is tomorrow, ten thirty, and got it right. Second announcement is um, the class does have a have a wiki for when you've got questions on assignments. Um, I'm still getting people emailing me like, uh, well, but if you put it on the wiki, then everyone can see it. Um, usually by this time of the semester, what I do is when someone e sends me an email um, about question about the assignment that's not personal in nature, I will then ignore it for a day or two and then answer it to encourage people to um, put the question on the wiki. Yes. Um, well, you can use the username SDSU and the password is CS696. Um, I did write it down on the board the first day of the class, but I don't. The problem with writing it down someplace where you can access it online is that people will access it online. It's hard to believe, but when Wikis first came out, um, no one bothered password protecting them or anything. And for a number of years, it worked fine. I mean, it wasn't a problem. And then one day, spammers discovered Wikis. And it's been downhill ever since. Right. Okay, so let's so I'm gonna start class um, talking about this app. Um, so this company built what they call a Sudoku solver. And what you do is you, in your phone, you, you put the camera so I can see the Sudoku puzzle. And then it, it sees it and it recognizes it and it solves it. And it was sort of neat. So you just, as you can see, I mean, they just, as soon as it recognizes what the puzzle is, so there it is. And there's a solution and it, um, and it overlays it, the solution on the, what you're seeing. Now it's interesting for a couple reasons. When they developed it, right, the first thing you have to do is you have to recognize those numbers, right? Um, to see what they are before you can actually try and figure out how to solve it. And so the first thing they did was they did it for the iPhone, so they did it in Swift. And the library, which is optical character recognition, right? That didn't work. Um, because it's not just pure text, right? There's a number and then a bunch of lines, and apparently I just screwed up the library. So then what they said was, well, look, oh, there's this, in machine learning, there's this classic problem and there's a classic data set where you recognize numbers from handwritten, right? And there's a huge data set, um, it's well known, and someone had already ported that model to the iPhone format, right? So you go, great, we're done, right? No, they're not done. They tried it and it didn't work. Um, because it's not handwritten, right? It's 
this type, this text. Um, so then, okay, so then what they did is they went out to this local bookstore and they bought every Sudoku book they could find. And then they cut it all up, right? And scanned it in. And when they were done, they had 600,000 separate images. So they could train, right, a machine learning algorithm. But the problem was to train it, you have to say, this is a two and that's a four, this is a six, right? And you have to do it for basically all 600,000 of those images. Um, fortunately, they were a gaming company and they got a bunch of crazy people that like their games. And so they just send a message out saying, hey, we got these images we'd like to be, you know, and within 24 hours, you know, all the images had been marked. Unfortunately, they didn't, some people didn't quite get the memo, like when you see a two, you type a two, you don't type a four, right? Um, so then they had a second round of, you know, having people go through and they see 20 a time, make sure that they're correct, right? But finally they got them all, you know, like they got all 600,000 and eventually they got over a million of the images and then they could train, right? Train it with their machine learning algorithm to recognize and they got like a 98.7 recognition, recognition success rate. They built their app and they put it on, right, the app store. And immediately they got people were complaining. Why? Well, because it's like, oh, this is great. But who's got a Sudoku puzzle in front of them, right? I don't. And so what, what do you do? You Google Sudoku puzzle, right? And you, and you get one on your screen. And then you take your phone and you're like, it's not working. There were two problems. One is the, the system they're using from the iPhone, it recognizes uh, horizontal services, not vertical services. And the other problem was the imaging system has a, uh, has a fixed focal length and people were too close or too far and so they weren't getting a clear image. And so then what they had to do is a guy spent that first week with almost no sleep, right, having to retrain it to deal with um, fuzzy images, All right? And, you know, then people could actually, you know, put it on, you know, scan a, game on their screen and have it solved, right? So it's now, um, if you happen to have an iOS device that's running um, OS 11, you can then download that. And then one of the craziest things too, like, despite how thin those lines are in the separate, even when the phone, like the camera actually moves away, Puzzle, the numbers still managed to stay and scale in that, yeah. uh, on that puzzle specifically. Yeah. So as this one comes away, the next one, all the numbers are still there and scale. Yeah, and that's that's actually what they were trying to do is they wanted to use the AR augmented reality kit to do it, but they also had to use right the ML kit to recognize the characters. Now, for me, for this course, what we're going to talk about now, there was sort of two interesting things. One is machine learning is now so common that third-party developers can use it on apps on a phone, right? This is how common it's become. It's not just Google and Apple embedding it in their hardware or software, which they both do, right? They both have hardware with machine learning embedded in it. Um, and Microsoft and Facebook do the same thing, right? Facebook on those server farms, they've got special purpose hardware to do machine learning. But this is third party developers embedding machine learning in apps on a phone, right? And the second important thing is, you know, look, they first say they went with the MNIST 
machine learning model and it didn't work because it was a wrong, it was trained on the wrong data set. And then secondly, when they trained it on their, you know, 600,000 images of numbers from Sudoku problems, it still had a problem because people weren't using it on, right? They weren't scanning it off of paper or sitting on a flat desk. And so the, how you train these things, what you train them for is important, right? So what I'm going to talk about today is, you know, Spark has machine learning embedded in it, right? And it has all the common machine learning algorithms that you would typically look at. Um, And now they've got machine learning library that works on top of RDDs and machine learning library that works on top of data frames, right? And they're both part of what they call the ML lib. Um, some people will call the second one Spark ML just because they created a separate lib separate package name for um, all the the data frame ones and the package name and is an ml and the other package name is ml lib like i said it does all all the standard um for machine learning things so if you take a machine learning course i don't know how deep they go into various algorithms but most of them that you're going to cover will, will be covered and uh, implemented spark um, there's various ways we can sort of categorize different machine learning algorithms. Um, the big category is supervised or unsupervised. Um, you know, supervised, you know, it's like here it is, right? Here, here's the training set, here's, what the, here's the data, and here's what it's supposed to be, right? And so you can train it. Um, unsupervised, it sort of learns by itself. And yeah, there's a bunch of different areas, classification. Um, you know, that sort of happens a lot in the sense of. Um, reinforcement, there's, there is some feedback where unsupervised is purely, um, So you're not as tightly like curating the data right. that you're training with, it's going right. to be unsupervised? Right. You know, classification is sort of like, okay, here's an x-ray image, is there a tumor in there or not, right? Yes or no, right? Um, Regression, you have data, um, the most common one, you probably know linear regression, where you're gonna fit a line to the data, and so you can figure out, okay, now I can use that line to figure out, if we got a new data point, where would it lie? Um, clustering, often you get data that clusters together, and then you have a new data point, where does it belong to? Um, so again, that's common. You might have, in the medical field, you might have various tests, right? And when your blood pressure is high and a few other things that are a certain range, that might be an indication that, that you're um, in danger or something. And so you might have a cluster over here, but then you have to worry about, now again, I got this n-dimensional space and you got your you know, various tests and now where do you belong, right? Um, you know, so there's a number of these common things. Um, and there's, you know, tons of different algorithms and processes. Um, we'll look at a few, but not, we're not going to look at all these. But there's a huge literature, right, um, that goes under uh, machine learning. You know, here's a bunch of supervised learning. Um,
you know, linear regression, um, you know, supervised learning sounds very fancy, right? What is linear regression? Well, you have a bunch of points and you then draw a line and try and minimize the error between the points and the line, and that's it, right? Um, statisticians have been doing that for decades, right? They've been doing that for, for a long, long, long time. And they really didn't call it machine learning. They just said, well, <laughs> I'm approximating this data with a line. Um, you know, there's a, a bunch of different um, unsupervised, you know, and k-means, clustering. You basically, here's the data. And you say, I think this, there's three clusters, and it will then try and it will then just figure out what the cluster should be. Um, so there's you know a lot of different um, the whole course, right? We could have a whole year sequence on just machine learning. Um, And a lot of it is detecting patterns, right? Um, you know, so one, one example is, you know, currently self-driving cars are a big thing. Um, and so there was this software developer in the Bay Area who saw what these companies were doing and said, that's crazy and it's very expensive. And so he just, he bought a car and then he bought a couple of web cameras um, he, he duct taped them onto his windshield and he connected them to a computer and he then connected his computer. He bought a car so they could connect it to, you know, the control system so they could monitor what was going on. And then he just drove and let the computer watch what he was doing. And um, after, you know, 10, 20 hours of observing him, he said he could then just drive down the freeway and take his hand off the wheel and it would work. Right? And it was just learning patterns, right? slides are more or less applicable ways of doing of accomplishing tasks like that. Yeah, tasks of different types, right? Yeah, yeah. And so the, the guy in the Bay Area, he, he actually wanted to sell a kit you could add to your own car. He, I mean, he, he was ready to do it. Um, he started advertising, and then the government said, uh, yeah, hold on here. We, we think you should probably show us that this actually is safe to use. And you said it's because it's not a good As soon as they said that, they said, I'm done. I'm not going to do that. But now there's, there's something I'm there is something you have to keep in mind when doing machine learning, right? It's pattern recognition, right? So here's here's a pattern, right? So so what should what should that question mark be? Right? Maybe there's more than one. Is it 32? Hey! Oh. 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 Winner's circle. <laughs> oh. 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 
and that's that's a problem, right? Um, there there's more than one pattern that matches, right? And there's um, you know the the free lunch theorem, which basically says you know for every pattern that a machine learning algorithm is good at, there's going to be a pattern that it's bad at, right? Um, You know, so there's all these machine learning algorithms that recognize faces and images. Um, and so then people are, you know, go, go to length to try and figure out what can we do to um, fool that algorithm, um, yeah. right? And so plain face, I can recognize it, you know, this crazy little mark, but no, and then you put the same mark, but so the opposite pattern on their cheek and it went, the algorithm wouldn't recognize the face, right? And there's even some very subtle examples where, you know, they've trained the the algorithm to recognize, you know, say a cat. And then what they do is they go in and take the image and they, they change to random pixels. And so when a human looks at it, it they really can't see it. It, still, it looks like almost identical to the original picture. But then it's, it's unrecognizable by, right, the algorithm, right? It's because they're they're doing pattern matching, um, and you have to be careful because, right, as it, you know, for every pattern it's good at recognizing, there's going to be another pattern that it's, it's not good at recognizing, and that. There's something that they keep in mind when you're doing machine learning. It's not magic, right? It's not. Um, you know, so recently, uh, Rodney Brooks, who is a, he's a famous um, roboticist at MIT, um, well, it was probably 10, 20 years ago, he was championing this idea that if you want to build um intelligent robots you start small you don't build a huge big you build a little you build basically a cockroach right and train it and figure out how to make it smart right um and so he came up with this article called the seven seven deadly sins of ai prediction um you know one is Emmer's law, which basically says we always overestimate the impact of technology in the short run and underestimate it in the long run. Um, the example they gave was the GPS system we use. Um, it was started in 1978 and it was built for one purpose, right? The whole system was built for one purpose, and that was so that the United States military could place bombs very precisely. That was it, right? The whole point of the GPS system was that. Right? It wasn't to help you drive cars or tell you where you are. It was to help the US military to precisely um, deliver munitions, right? But of course, um, this first real use came in 1991 with Desert Storm. And even then it took the military several more years to fully adopt using a GPS system. You know, so it took a long time, right? Um, for the system to be used for its, its intended purpose. Um, but now, I mean, every mobile phone has GPS built in, and so we now have got maps, right? And so everyone, not only can you know where you are, you can get directions wherever you are, pretty much, like you get cell connection, and 
Google knows where you are, and they then use that information to give you real-time traffic location, right? Um, so now when you go home, you can look at the ma Google Maps, and it'll tell you where all the traffic is, and that's all from the cell information and, and GPS information, and the phone's knowing how fast you're going. Um, it's also used to navigate planes and trucks, to track them. Um, U.S. Electrical Grid uses it to keep things in sync because you need to know where things are and where the power is going, how far you are. And farmers actually use it to figure out, you know, where in the field you plant a particular, particular type of seed because this part is wetter than that part, so we need to plant something that can, right, um, go on the wet part of the field. And th so it's... You're all right. I mean, it's a point now where if that system were to disappear, could we function, right? It, it's basically integrated into our entire life. Um, so it's an example where, you know, they started with, oh, this would be this great thing for the military and took a long time for that to come about. Um, so you sort of overestimated the effect it's going to have initially, but in the long term, I mean, no one, no one saw, I mean, no one foresaw that the GPS system was going to be used to drive tractors, right? I mean, this was nothing. I mean, it was not in anyone's vision of what the system would be used for, right? His third one was performance versus competence. And here he says, yeah, I mean, we can build a system that can look at this picture and we can train it to recognize that there's a, fris fris there's a Frisbee there, right? Um, but it's not the same thing as a person. You know, a person, we can then generalize the Frisbee. We can figure out how basic size it is, how much it weighs. Um, we can estimate how far it's going to go, all kinds of things, right? And so we, we sort of extrapolate from the fact that the computer can figure out that's a Frisbee to think that it can also do all the things we will do when we look at the picture, right? But that's not the case, right? We train it to, you know, recognize it as a Frisbee, recognize it as a cat, um, but that doesn't mean... You know, we, we imply all kinds of things that we can then do with that information, and that's not true of can't make all the other associations that we we even a five year old does, right? I mean, yeah, not three or some other number. Um, we talk about exponential growth, right? Um, you know, the computer industry, we're used to this, right? We're used to, oh, Moore's laws, things are gonna go faster and faster all the time. Um, we're used to this having a great impact, um, but exponential growth is not sustainable, right? You know, the, the one I like is, when you take biology, the, you know, yeast cells can double, every, you know, every so often, right? And so then you compute how long will it take that culture of yeast to populate the entire planet, um, or how long will it take for the the mass of that yeast to be larger than the mass of the Earth, right? And you go, well, I'm sorry, but it can't. That can never happen because where is it going to get the mass from, right? It can't be larger than the mass that already exists on the planet. Um, and this example was, look, you know, early on when you looked at the the modern memory and iPods for your music, I mean, it was growing, it was doubling every year, right, every year. And so we should be able to have, you know, terabytes of data on our phones, right? But we don't, um, in part because at some point, the capacity is large enough that it's sufficient for any purpose we have, right? And so we, we slow down, but also, how are you going to fit 100 terabytes of stuff in your pocket, right? Just, you know, the space.
And so we, what's that? DNA storage. DNA storage, right. But it doesn't exist yet, right? Right. Mm. So you have to be careful about extrapolating what we can do with these things. Um, and there's a lot of a lot of excitement and hype, um, and expectations about um, AI and deep learning, and you know we're going to have. People, you know, are we going to have self-driving cars next year, the following year? And people, you know, some people say, oh, it's, it's just almost there. Some people say, well, maybe in 15 or 20 years. Um, deep learning is a hot topic now. And the basic breakthrough came in 1986. Um, and for about 20 years, the idea basic idea that makes deep learning useful was this whole idea was abandoned because it didn't work for 20 years, right? It just didn't work. And when it started working, a lot of the old guys in AI were like, so what's different than what we did 20 years, 30 years ago? And the answer was nothing was different. The only thing that changed was um, all of a sudden we can now train these things on GPUs, you know, that were thousands of times faster than what you were doing. And so now we can just train them much, much faster, right? So what would you take, take you, it would take you years to do before and you never spent the time to train it, we can now do in days, right? Um, and so some people are thinking that this whole hype of machine learning is just, it's just one breakthrough, um, and, and after that is just refinement. So okay, we can do deep learning with more layers or fewer layers, or we'll tweak the, how the layers are connected. Um, so it's not clear, right, that we're going to see this huge. We may have seen the peak or a plateau of what we can do, um, and it may take another twenty years for people to take discoveries they're doing now to make them work. And given that machines aren't getting faster anymore, right? The CPUs have basically plateaued. Um, GPUs are still faster, but they're starting to plateau too, right? Um, and now we're looking at special purpose hardware just designed to do machine learning to keep up that speed performance. So it's just a sort of background, right? Machine learning is big. Um, as computer science students, you should know about it and be able to do a little bit of it. It's not um, probably not going to save the world. Um, Now, basically what you do, machine learning, all these algorithms, you produce a model, right? And that model could be as simple as here's, here's a line, right? You know, f of x equals 2x plus 3, right? And that's a model. And then you say, okay, now if x is 10, what is f of x, right? That's a model, a very simple model. Um, and so that model then, we, we build this model with this, a line or some neural networks have been trained to recognize cats, um, right? We can then use that model to, to predict things. Oh, here's the line. What happens when X is 20? Well, it should be about here, right? Um, right? Now, the thing to keep in mind about models is models are just approximate reality. They just approximate reality. When I was an undergraduate student, I had a friend who 
um, he recognized this very early on, right? And so he would make these arguments. Um, we're taking a physics class and say, well, these equations are, are just models and there's approximate, right? And so he would argue that, well, um, you write down some crazy equation and say, well, that, that, that's a model I can use to model gravity too. And like, no, 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 this is, we all know the Newton's law of forces, blah, blah. And no, 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 you're wrong because they're just models. And of course we never believed him, but he was, he was right. They were models, right? And, um, you know, the world is flat. That is a model, right? And it worked for thousands of years, right? We really didn't need a model more accurate than that for most for for a long, long time, for th tens of thousands of years. It worked fine, right? You know, there was a logical problem that happens when you fly when you travel to the ocean and get the edge, right? And, and what's underneath it, and you got those turtles holding up Earth, and then it was turtles all the way down. But it, it didn't really affect day-to-day -day life. You could carry out business. Um, but then eventually when you started you know, sailing far enough, it was like, well, this is not going to work. How is this working? And so then we get this model. It's a, the world's a sphere, right? It's a, it's a circus. It's a ball. Um, and then again, was sufficient for a long, long time, right? But it's not completely accurate. And there are, the model is not sufficient for, you know, some very fine calculations. Um, so it's really, right, an ellipsoid, um, odd shape, and if you actually you know, some things NASA does and some things that the military do, does. Modeling the world as a sphere does not work, right? Because the gravity is different and you're trying to do these trajectories. It's, it's, it, you're going to be off. Um, you know, so you have to figure out it's a model and it's going to approximate reality and how close to reality you have to be, right, to be useful. Right? I mean, does this model produce... Um, useful um, predictions or insights. That's just, right? You know, when's that model going to be useful, right? And how much air is there? Um, So when we're modeling things, usually there's lots of different factors, right? Um, you know, so if we're looking at Amazon, we want to know their daily revenue. I mean, literally, Amazon knows, you know, if they can reduce the latency on their web page by this many milliseconds, they know how much the revenue is going to increase, right? They've computed this, they've done it over and over, and over again. But it's not the only thing that determines that, right? Um, the price, right? Um, if the price is lower, they're going to get they're going to get more orders, right? How much more depends upon, and then you have to worry about well, if you lower the price too much, right? Then you get more orders, but you're getting less revenue overall. Um, literally. You know, everyone knows what the one-click um, patent they have, right? So one-click, you can submit your order. Um, they know this, right? They know that the number of steps you have to go through actually interferes with how much revenue they get. The page layout, they literally, Amazon and all these web companies are doing experiments daily with tweaking the layouts of this and that and what you do. And they... They do A-B testing, right? So they figure out, okay, this feature works better than that feature, and they're continuing to refine it. So all these things, right? I mean, literally all these things play a role in the revenue. They do measure the dwell time, yes, right? They want to know how long are you on that page before you move on, and where do you go, right? I mean, literally, yes. 
But the one thing we have to keep in mind is that not all these different features, right, have the same impact on, right, their daily revenue, right? Some have a larger impact. Right. Some features are more important, and it's also stochastic. It's not. We're dealing with, with people behavior and lots of people's behavior, so it's not going to be a straight line, right? Now, when we're dealing with, if we're dealing with mathematics, we might call these all these latency, right? Um, independent variables, and then we might call the daily revenue the dependent variable, right? So we would have some function f of x, y, z, y, and z, right? That's going to compute the revenue based upon these independent or supposedly independent variables. In the Spark world, well, they're going to call these, they're going to call all these depend, independent variables features, right? These are the features we're going to look at. And they're going to call then what we're looking at as a label. Right? And a label is going to depend upon the features. All right? We call it independent variables, whereas in Spark, they'll, they'll call them features. So far, so good. Just sort of general information. Um, so when you look at models, um, so what I want to do now is I want to look at linear regression because it's a very simple model. Um, go through some things you're not going to like, some mathematics and how we draw the line, et cetera. Um, and then when we're done, we'll go back to looking at Spark and eventually, well, how do we actually do this in Spark, right? Um, and so your regression, right, there's a relationship between, you know, one variable and one more other independent variables, right? And so if you're used to, you know, computing the, the line example, there is one independent variable, one dependent variable, but you, we could have multiple independent variables. And so, yeah, the, the simplest one is linear regression, right? We're just, we're just going to, there's going to be a line, right? Um, we can do multiple integration where we have um, more than one independent variable, and then we can generalize it to various other types. Um, yeah, so we can ask questions like, is the independent variable actually related to the independent variable, right? I mean, they may not be, right? Or the, they might be weakly related, right? There might be there might be ten features that determine right the outcome, and some only have a little effect, and some other have big effects. Um, you have to generate the model with their errors, and we can compute what the effects are, right? Okay. So one example. Um, in the current um, communications of the ACM, there's an article about do programming languages have any impact on the number of bugs or errors in software, right? You know, people like to argue that their language is better than other language, right? And so what, the, what they did is they went to GitHub and they looked at, you know, 60 or 70 projects and I forget how many millions of lines of code that involved. And they wanted to then look at, they did that because then they could look at 
at the the um, every time they you pushed a uh, update, they could look at the why it was what was changed and why it was changed, right? And so they could they went through and found all the po updates that said, look, here's a bug fix, right? Um, and then they looked at the various languages to see which ones were had. The project the user language had fewer of these um, bug fixes, and of course they then found, oh, functional programming languages have fewer bugs than non-functional. Oh, that's sort of nice. Um, functional programming languages that have um, static type checking have fewer bugs than ones that don't, and the language which had the fewest bugs, right, was closure. Scalar was not far behind. Except, and if, and it was a significant, it was, you know, they could prove it was significant, right? So these are the error bars and all the crazy things. But they also said the language explained 1% of the difference between the different projects. So it's like, in other words, when we look at projects that use, say, Scala and projects that use um, C, um, the language itself explained only 1% of the difference. And 1% is like nothing, right? No, it was something else. So what? You know, so they determined that we know that the it's not just a language, right? And they determined that the language only was responsible for like one percent of the differences. Something else was responsible for ninety nine percent of the differences. And one of those things might be like the quality of the programmer, right? I mean, but the importance is, right, you have to understand, right, there's going to be a, there may be multiple infinite variables and we have, and there might be some which are more influential than others, right? So linear regression, like I said, it's just a straight line, right? Um, and often you'll see it like this, right? Y is equal to, right? And it's a model, right? And X is independent variable, Y is independent variable. And now we can predict, well, when X is 30, then it's gonna be 63. Y is gonna be 63. Now, typically we're dealing with data which isn't, isn't straight mathematical, and so here's a plot, and and you, it sure looks like it's it's pretty linear, right? Um, and so we we may either because we know we understand the process that's going on here, or just by examining the data, say okay, we we think it's going to linear, and so it should fit this form, and now we can. Uh, now we just need to find A and B, right? And so we, we then can, you know, draw a line and try and find a line that fits the data best. Um, and once, once we have A and B, then we can actually start computing what's the actual error between the line we draw and all our data. Right, so we might then, you know, draw that line, and then once we draw this line, we can now, we could actually compute, you know, what's the total error, right? We know all, all the points from where, where we expect them to be and where they, they actually are. And this error is, is usually called residual, right? So you'll, you'll see that term, residuals, what are the residuals? Um, and the goal is to 
to reduce the overall residuals, right? Overall error between the data and the actual line. Um, you know, so this, you know, it's clear we could probably draw a line as a pretty, pretty good fit for the data, right? Uh, this plot, it still looks like it's somewhat linear, but it's not quite as good, right? Um, right, so the, the errors are going to be larger, right? So there's probably more going on. There's probably another feature that we don't know about that is making the change, right? May not have as big effect as X does, but right, there may be a Z, and if we know what Z was, we could see, get a better idea. Uh, right, all of a sudden, yeah, we could we could draw a straight line, but it's not looking like it should be a straight line, right? Um, oh. There is a straight line here, but, you know, and we, we could, I mean, we, we could draw a line and we could compute the residuals and um, on both of these, we could do that, but this one is like, it sure doesn't look like it's gonna be, right? So note one thing already, um, how useful being able to visualize the data is, right? You know, we could, you know, there's a formula we can use to compute this line, right? Right, and we'll see it in a little bit. And we, we could use that formula here and here, and we get a result. Um, but, this tells us a lot already, right? Um, are they related? The first in the first graph, the, I think the answer is pretty clear, right? X and Y are highly related. Um, it doesn't look like it, right? It doesn't look like they're related. Now, I don't know how many of you know the comic strip XKCD. Um, so he has this idea that um, he doesn't trust linear regression when it's harder to guess the direction of the correlation from the scatter plot than to find a new constellation in it, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, literally, we, we, we can draw the line, we do the calculation, we'll get this line, but. Right. So we have, um, there are ways of trying to determine how related two variables are, right? Um, so the covariance, you take the, the mean, the average value of x now, visual y, y, um, and then you compute these dx, dy, see how, how far they are. Each individual point is different from the average. And if they're related, you expect them to vary together, right? You know, if it's a line and line is increasing, as x increases, y is going to increase, right? In which case, as dx increases, dy is going to increase, right? Um, and so then statisticians will compute this covariance by just multiplying the two together and right, dividing by n because n points, and then measure. And that will give us a measure 
of how well these two things are related. Right, so it's a rather simple formula, right? You just compute the mean of x, compute the mean of y, every data points, and then subtract the mean off from each data point to see the direction is, you know, whether it's positive or negative, and then you multiply them together um, for each i, sum it up, and divide by n, right? And so, um, if that covariance is close to zero, there's pretty much no relationship. The larger the number is, the stronger the relationship. And negative values mean they're related, but in the opposite way, right? As x increases, y is decreasing. So it looks like an example. Um, so this simple little example where um, we're buying something and we're given how many pounds we buy and how much it costs, right? So someone bought three pounds and it cost them nine bucks and someone bought seven pounds and it cost them $24 and someone bought 10 pounds and it cost them 38, right? Are these two things related? Um, and we can then com compute the um, covariance again by you, you just do the simple formula, right? You find the average and you subtract the average from each of at a point. And you, um, but we could. Um, Convert it to grams, right? I mean, in India, do you use pounds? Do you measure things in pounds, ounces? What's that? Kilograms. Kilograms, right. In grams, right? So do it in kilograms. That's what you're going to get, right? When we, when we compute this number in terms of grams, it's larger. Well, because the numbers are larger, right? What's that? Right, so the problem is that the size, the scale affects things, right? So one thing you have to be careful of is, right, when you're dealing with these, creating these models, you have to worry about the scale. You know, well, we could do it in pesos, but I didn't do it in pesos. I did it in terms of um, rupees, and it is just much worse, right? <laughs> so one thing we have to worry about when we're dealing with machine learning, it happens a lot, is we have to rescale things, right? And so one of the things we'll do when we get to Spark is, how can we rescale our data? And there are various different standard ways of doing it. Um, now, what's going on here, if you ever took a physics course, um, you know, when, when we compute the covariance of pounds per cost, what we're getting is the covariance in terms of pounds times US dollars, right? And we did in terms of grams, we, we got in terms of grams times US dollars. And once you put the units on, then, then it becomes clear, oh, we could, those, those actually are the same thing. And there's, there's a conversion factor because we convert grams to pounds, we can do it, right? Um, so taking physics classes was useful if you, if you did it. If you didn't do it, it's too bad, it's too late. Um, you know, so we we have to worry about normalizing the data, and one way of doing that is um, divide by the maximum value. 
All right. So in that case, you know, here's our chart, but if we divide by the maximum value, um, the cost becomes, right, goes from zero to one, and the amount, or the pounds goes from zero to one, and it doesn't matter whether we use pounds or grams, right, because um, we divide by the maximum value, we've got the same ratio. And now we can compute the covariance in a standard format. We don't have to worry about what currency we're using or what unit of measurement for the mass we're using. There's actually um, an important calculation that statisticians use. It actually has a person's name associated with it, um, Pearson's correlation, and it has a standard letter, R. Um, and it's just the covariance divided by the standard deviation of X times the standard deviation of Y. Um, and do it, divide by the standard deviation of both of them, it removes a unit, so it becomes unitless, so it becomes um, normalized, and the range is from minus one to one, um, and zero means they're not related at all, one means that they are highly related, and negative one means they're inversely related. And so when we, when we compute that Pearson's coefficient on this example, it doesn't matter whether you use pounds or grams. Um, we get the same value, even if we and if we did it in right. Now here's a fun part with statistics. Um, So we've got this nice formula we can use. Um, Spark it for us. So we can just basically input the data and it says, here's the value of R. Um, but interpret it, you know, again, we've got this basic interpretation. One means highly related, zero means not related. And then some wise guy comes up with these examples. So in the top part, um, you know, Clearly related, clearly linear line. When you compute the R value, you get one. And on this range, it's clearly it's not related. I mean, it is related, but it's inversely, so it's negative one. And then as you get, as you get fuzzier, right, then, yeah, that makes sense because this is clearly just a bunch of stuff that's randomly plotted, right? And so it should be zero. And then that makes sense. Um, and then this 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 would make sense too because well still there's still lines right, and then you have a problem when you've got horizontal line or vertical line. Um, well, and then they did you know weird things like this to show that you can really there is a relationship here right. It's a very complicated one, but we just get zero. Um, there's also, and this is, that's also, there's something going on here, right? They are related in a weird way, but when you use the equation, you get zero. So statistics are useful, but you have to be careful, right? You have to, There's a very old book with his title, which is great. There's lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? But again, when you when you have terabytes of data, um, you can do some you can crunch those numbers to try and produce a model to tell something. Um, you can't look at each each number and examine them. And so now we can take we can 
take this example and we can comp compute this as you know 0.992 and so and match it and match what we see right it sure looks like a line it tells us a line um, but now the question is how do we compute that line right um, how do we get that well there is a um, ordinary of these squares where you want to find x and y mean that you know we compute the we, we compute the means we compute these differences and that's our b it's also we get the same value here and once we got b then we can compute a by um, using the mean of a time, right? So we get, you know, so now we have a way of asking, are these two things related, yes or no, right? You know, give us a measure. Second thing, right, we can now, we've got an equation we, we can use to actually compute that line and, and minimize the errors of residuals. And of course, Spark will compute both of these values for us, um, as well, basically, if you're in MATLAB, they're gonna have, right, the do the calculations for us. You Python, NumPy will do it for us, right? So any sort of software user analysis would compute these things for us now so we don't have to hand crank out the formula. We don't have to know the formula. It's really important to know what it means when we use it. So it's a very short, brief introduction to linear regression, right? It's just we're just going to estimate the line. We have a way of estimating how well they're related and how to compute the line. So now we can go back to Spark. Um, so Spark um, MLlib has a couple of basic data types to use. One is called a vector. And then there's a matrix, which presumably everyone knows what those mean. The vector is just, you know, a it's a collection of numbers in order, in some order. A matrix is two dimensional. They also have um, dense and sparse versions of each. Um, so here's an example of creating a dense vector using um, mllib. Which is actually, which is a version for working on RDDs. Um, we can compute a, create a sparse one. Um, the syntax is the first number is how, how many elements should the vector hold? Um, the next is an array of indices that have non-zero elements. And then the third one are the values um, at those indices, right? So it says that zero, zeroth element and the eighth element are on zero. And the second array says that the zeroth element is gonna be 5.1 and three is going to be the eighth element. And the reason for having sparse ones to be clear is if you've got a huge vector, it's, you know, 100,000 elements long and 80% of them are zeros, it's going to be more efficient to space wise the storm as a dense, or as a sparse, right? It does mean that accessing each element is going to be slower, right? So it becomes the classic trade-off between space and time.
How earth shattering, right? I mean, it's just. But if you haven't done numerical calculations on large data sets, you probably not probably haven't seen sparse matrices or sparse vectors. But as soon as you start trying to load, you know, a a 100 by 100 matrices full of doubles, I mean, you start realize it takes up a lot of space, and if most of them are zeros. Um, things are going to go better if you use a different representation. And so Spark does it for us, hasn't built in for us. And then you can you know, typo, but you can convert a sparse one to an array or to a dense one. There's a method on them to, if you actually need it um, to be dense so you can do much faster calculations, you can do that. And you can also, instead of rays, you can use sequences. Right? So far, so good. And here's where it's not so good. I don't know why they did this. And I don't know. Um, like I said, so in Spark, there's the the libraries for RDDs, doing machine learning RDDs, and the library for doing it on uh, data sets, right? But they, the, each of those libraries define their own version of um, vectors and dense vectors. What I don't know is um, if I can create a vector from the ML lib and use it in the ML library. I, didn't, I haven't tried that out. But basically, there doesn't seem to be any reuse between the two libraries. They seem to be completely, they re-implemented everything. Right. Yeah, and you have to be careful. Um, scale also has a vector class. Um, so you need to make sure that you're not using the scalar one and spark one. Um, and here's an example of doing a matrix. Um, the ML library, the the ML lib library is now under maintenance mode. They, they don't plan on they plan on keeping it. They don't plan on getting rid of it. Um, but it's mainly used to work on RDDs. Um, so what you want to use really depends upon whether do you have data which can go into a data for, data set or not, data frame or not. Um, and so next time we'll look at an actual example.